Look at your neighbor and say, God loves you. Look at another neighbor and say, God loves me. Amen. Join me today, church family, in Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter 2. Ruth, chapter 2. As we often say around the Mission Church, all books have the ability to inform you, but only the Bible has the power to transform you. Amen? Amen. So Ruth chapter 2, our sermon series is called Trusting the Invisible Hand of God. We are learning about God's providence. Whenever it looks like life is at its most difficult, God is up to some of His best work. Whenever it feels like life is over our head, we're being reminded that it's always under God's feet. We're being reminded that whenever we feel like it's helpless and hopeless, with God, He is always making a way. We must never confuse the silence of God with the absence of God. We're going to be learning that principle from Ruth and then Esther, the two books in the Bible named after females. Our sermon title, the second part of it, we began it last Sunday, is when the maid of Moab meets the bachelor of Bethlehem. When we have the story of Ruth and Boaz meeting, we want to see the behind the scenes of how God was bringing together these life details. Not the big and grandiose miracles, but in the normal everyday occurrences that God's handiwork is always in process. That God's providence is His hand, invisible hand, in the glove of humanity. It was true for Ruth, and it's true for you as well. That God is moving in your life. That God is up to something. That whenever you feel like you do not have any way forward, God is making a way for you. And He lets you set in that sometimes challenges to be able to grow your faith. To be able to build up your strength and your dependence upon Him. And for you to be a testimony to the watching world around you. I read this week about a little boy, a teenage boy, who was growing up in poverty. And he was growing up in boredom in the 1700s. His name was Finn. And Finn wanted a slice of the excitement that took place on the high seas. He lived in a port town and he knew that often the pirates would come in and they would dock their ship and they would have their festivities and funds and then they'd go out and they would do what pirates do. And Finn was very uh, appealing to that. He wanted to experience that kind of excitement in life. So he snuck down to one of these uh, pirate ships. He snuck on board. He hid himself. And once the ship was out to sea, he was finally discovered. Now fortunately, the captain of the ship did not cast him overboard. Did not send him down to Davy Jones's locker. But he gave the boy an opportunity to be a cabin boy. And sure enough, young Finn was earning his keep. Well, as happens with piracy, the, the British army was coming after them, their military, and they saw on the horizon one Navy British ship. All the pirates began to get nervous, but they looked at their captain. The captain simply said, Finn, go get my red shirt. They didn't know what that was about, but they brought the red shirt to the captain. The, the military jumped on board. They fought valiantly, and the pirates won the day. So Finn asked the captain, what's the deal with the red shirt? The captain said, I wear a red shirt. So in battle, if I am cut and I begin to bleed through, my crew doesn't see my blood, and they stay courageous, and they do not fear, and they stay in the battle. Is that's a great idea. Well, sure enough, just a few weeks later, there were two British ships that were coming for them. And again, everybody was fearful. They looked to the captain, and the captain told Finn, get my red shirt. Again, the battle was ferocious and fierce, but they won the day. The next month, the entire navy of the British army came against them. The whole horizon was full of ships. 
The crew was certainly fearful, but they knew the courage of the captain. And so Finn said, should I go get your red shirt, captain? He said, no, go get my brown pants. <laughs> Hey, sometimes we feel courageous and sometimes we feel more like brown pants. Amen. In our story here today, in our Bible account, there was probably some courage at first. We're learning how Ruth said, hey, Naomi, I'm going to follow you back to Bethlehem. I'm willing to step out of the unknown and into your presence with the Lord. Step out of what's familiar to me to what's unfamiliar. She probably felt pretty courageous. But once they got back to Bethlehem, reality began to set in. Their bellies were hungry. They knew that their options were few. They were not sure where they were going to lay their head, how they were going to have their next meal, what was tomorrow and next week going to look like. So that courage that they had first projected, that Ruth had, was probably starting to, to deteriorate, was probably starting to drop on the, the faith meter. Fear was starting to rise up. you ever been that way in your life? Where there was a time you felt courageous, you felt like God was able to, to conquer anything through you. You're ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. You're saying yes to God before knowing all the details. And then you get into the mix of it. And next thing you know, doubt begins to creep in. You begin to feel fear. You begin to wonder, where is God in all of this? The daily responsibilities, the daily tasks, the burdens of life, the challenges you face begin to feel overwhelming. And it's easy for us to begin to say, well, God must have forgotten about me. Maybe the courage I once had was a false courage. Maybe I was just kind of talking to myself. Maybe I really didn't hear from God. Maybe I should just stop this life of faith and just give up. Well, God doesn't want us to give up. He wants us to grow up. Amen? If God's wanting to use those challenges to perfect us and to correct us and to draw us closer to Him. And He wants to remind us when life is so fearful for us, He is doing something behind the scenes ready to provide and make a way. We're learning from that today. Let's move quickly so we can cover this entire chapter today. Ruth chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 in your outline, it's the mission of Ruth. Verses 1 and 2, we will not go deep into these first two verses. If you missed the sermon last week, please check it out on our sermon archives on our website. You want to hear that message for a greater depth. But verse 1 and 2 says this, There was a relative of Naomi's husband. Remember his name was Elimelech. He was the one that disobeyed God, ran in fear to Moab, took his family with him. He died in the far off country. Then his two sons died as well, leaving the three widows. Orpah remained in Moab. Ruth went with her mother-in-law, Naomi, back to Bethlehem. It says that he was a great man of wealth. Some translations say a mighty man of valor. Some translations say a noble man. This was the same descriptor, same title, the same adjective given to other judges in the Bible. People like Gideon and Jephthah and Samson. So we have our first thought here is this man Boaz going to be like these other characters during the book of Judges. Is this going to be a man that God's hand was upon, but in the end he ultimately disappoints? Is Boaz going to be a man who has great potential but doesn't fully reach it? The reader of this is supposed to be hanging on that thought at this point in time. Now we know because we've read the Bible through, we've read this book through, we know that Boaz does not disappoint. Amen? Amen. We learned that Boaz wasn't like the other judges. He wasn't like Gideon. He wasn't like Samson. He wasn't like Jephthah or one of the other 12 judges. The 13th was a female judge. But the other 12 men who were fallible and weak and they had an opportunity but they failed. We see that Boaz rises to the occasion. 
Now remember last week we learned that everything in the Old Testament, including this book, foreshadows and paints a picture of the romance of redemption. It always points forward to Christ, the story of salvation, the glory of God, and the good of mankind. So as we read this chapter today, in fact, this entire book, we must be reminded that Boaz represents Jesus Christ. And that Ruth represents us, the bride of Christ. That we have a groom, we have a husband, we have a pursuer that doesn't fail us. Amen? Amen. That Boaz represents Christ, and we know that our Christ is the perfect Savior. That He is the perfect Redeemer. That we're going to see Him pictured through Boaz on many occasions throughout this chapter of the family of Limelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she doesn't know about Boaz yet. It's written by the author of this book to give us a sneak peek, uh, an early look at who Boaz is. But she doesn't know that yet. This is God working in preparation to bring them together. But Ruth is simply saying, let me go out and find a field where a, an owner will be kind to me. And she said to her, go my daughter. And we ended last week asking the question that why did not Naomi go herself? Then Naomi said, yeah, you can go, but I'm not going to go. I wonder if discouragement had set in. I wonder if she had started to kind of throw her hands up in exasperation. I wonder if she said, well, I thought I'd come back and God would just provide things for me. But things were more challenging than she thought. She said, yes, you can go, but I'm going to stay home. Now that was a risky thing for Ruth to do. She was a Moabitess. This was an enemy of the nation of Israel. She was also living in the time of the judges where there were many nefarious and sordid things that were taking place. She was a vulnerable young lady going out on her own. You must see the faith and the obedience required in this. That she had to step outside of her safety net to step into what was scary and uncertain. But the life that pleases God always requires that. The Bible says that faith is what honors the Lord. That we can try to always play it safe. But when we play it safe, we're never going to trust in God to do the impossible in our lives. That God wants us to step into the unknown, trusting in Him to provide, to show up, and to show off in our life circumstances. So the mission of Ruth, she was going to the fields. Number two, the meeting of Boaz. Here we go, verse three. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz who was of the family of Elimelech. Now there's a small war boy. It's like a boiler in here. <laughs> Who's hot? Who's cold? That's the way it works. <laughs> Let's bump it down a degree or two, please. I might just have a heat stroke up here. <laughs> That's one thing you'll never get everybody to agree on in church. Amen. The, the volume of the music and the temperature of the room. You'll never get those two things agreed upon by everybody. But if if I don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pass out. So here we go. Turn that down just a little bit. So it says this. Happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Happened. Don't miss that word. This was a, from a human perspective, it looked like a happened. It looked like it was a, a by chance. It was by luck that she showed up at the right field. But I tell you, with God, there are no happenstances. There are no uh, possibilities. With God, He has all things planned by His providential purpose. That God's hand is in the, in the glove of humanity. And we see that taking place here. And thank God she is brought to that field because it's going to be able to set the stage for this whole story of the kinsman redeemer. So now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem 
and said to his reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Again, that's there intentionally to show us the contrast with Boaz and the rest of those living in the time of the judges. Here was a man who was a shining light in a dark place. Here was a man who was trying to still obey God when everybody else was doing what was right in their own eyes. Here was a man who was trying to lead his life and lead his company in a way that was honoring to God. How would you feel if you showed up to work on Monday and your boss came in and said something like this to you? The Lord be with you. It'd probably shock you. We have a day and time where they say, well, you can't talk like that in the workplace. Well, why not? Amen. Amen. I think we need to carry Christ with us wherever we go. Not just with our words, but with our actions. Here was a man who, he was known by his faith. That he spoke the word of God. He lived the word of God. And his reapers, the ones who are working for him, responded with the word of bless you. God bless you. So we're getting the picture that in the context that this was a good man. Not like the other judges. A man who was living a noble life. A man who had character. We're going to see the, the issue of character repeatedly through this chapter. That Ruth is a woman of character. That Boaz is a man of character. God wants us as believers in Christ to be people of character. Our reputation and our character are two different things. Your reputation is what people think of you. Your character is what God knows of you. Amen? Amen. Your character is who you are when nobody else is watching. Your character is what God is most concerned with. Your character is what will take you from this earth and it will go with you to heaven. Your, your, uh, your uh, reputation does not. Reputation is important to man, but character is important to God. The Bible says that God looks at the heart while man looks at the exteriors. God's concerned about your heart. He's concerned about what you do and why you do it. So I want you to see that Boaz was a man of character. That he was a good man and more than a good man, he was a godly man. It says this, Then Boaz said to his servants, Who was in charge of the reapers? Whose young woman is this? So he looks out into the field. He sees this young woman who is reaping. And remember that was a, uh, Boaz being faithful to the law of the land that said, if you have property, if you have a harvest, do not reap the corners. God told His people, the nation of Israel, to cut corners in this one area that not to reap the corners because that was God's social uh, way to provide for the least of these. It was God's heart of compassion. We talked a lot about that last week, so we will not readdress that this week. But Boaz was being faithful. I'm sure many in that day were not. Many in that day, just as we are today, that money is the bottom line. I'm not going to do things God's way because I want to have all that I can financially now, right? Sometimes people want to look at God, money as a, a God in their life. They look at money as the most important thing. Well, Jesus tells us, right, that if you are loving money, that becomes your God. And where your wealth is, there your heart will be. There are many of us, even as Christians, in our personal finances and in our businesses, we allow the bottom line to drive us more than obedience to God. But here Boaz was leaving the corners of the field vacant so that people like Ruth could come in and provide for themselves. We learned last week that God's plan was not for handouts, but hand-ups. It was for Ruth not just to sit at home and Naomi to sit at home and wait for somebody, the government, the king, the judge, Boaz, to give them something, but it was their job to go out and to be able to work hard and to be able to be responsible for their own life. Through God's provisions, it's a joint partnership, and we see the beauty of that here. 
So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. So her reputation preceded her. Whenever he came back and said, Who is that out in the field? We don't know if there was a, an attraction at first sight. Probably not. Most scholars were saying that at this point in time, he was just like curious. Who was that out there working so hard? He'd been used to seeing the people who in need, who are uh, <coughs> impoverished, coming and working in the fields. But here was somebody new, somebody he had never seen before. So he inquired about her, and somehow this foreman knew that she was this Moabite. That was important. She was from a far country, the enemies of Israel, but said she's a little different. She is a faithful worker who is providing well for her mother-in-law. And she said, please, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now through the rest, though she rested little in the house. So he said that she came, she did not come demanding she came with a humble spirit and asked, Could I please glean in the corners of your field? I'm in great need. Then she went out and she had a strong work ethic. She worked all day, only taking a reasonable rest. So her reputation preceded her. It reminds us that people are watching our lives. That people are watching how we live. Your family is watching how you live. Your neighbors are watching how you live. Your co-workers are watching how you live. Your church family is watching how you live. You have a testimony. The question is, do you have a good testimony or a bad testimony? Does your life point people to Jesus or does your life repel people from Christ? The number one reason that people follow the Lord is because of Christians. The number one people reason people don't follow the Lord is Christians. Did you know that? That your life matters. The way you lead your life makes a difference. People are watching. And if you want to make a difference in the world, you've got to be willing to be different. You've got to put Christ first in your life. Following the example of Ruth here, she came with a humble spirit. Some people are so proud they can strut sitting down, right? Christians are to have a humble spirit. We're supposed to be submissive to God's will and God's word. We're supposed to be the best servants that we possibly can be. It's not the little Pharisee inside of us that always wants to be recognized. We're finding ways to serve others. We want to be the best employees we can be. We want to go above and beyond for our neighbors. We want to be servants to our family. We want to have a good character and a good reputation for Jesus. We also want to be known for our hard work. We don't want to be known as lazy. We don't want to be known as people who want to give up responsibility so other people can take care of us. Many people with nickname could be blister. They show up when all the work's done. Amen? We as Christians want to be ones who are, are working hard in faithfulness to God. The Bible says, whatever you put your hand to, do it heartily unto the Lord. We should be the best employees that a company has. We should be the hardest working at whatever God has called us to do. Because we know that our ultimate boss is a Jewish carpenter. Amen? Amen. That our boss is not the earthly boss. Good, bad, or different they may be. Our boss is Jesus Christ. And what we do is our service to Him. At the mission church, we try to train every member to be a missionary. One of the greatest mission fields you have is your place of employment. And if you're not currently employed, maybe you are in college or in high school, that is your job for now. Be the greatest witness you can be there. Don't give a half an attention. Don't give a kind of just a little bit of effort. Whatever you put your mind to, whatever God leads you to do, do it with all of your heart. We see that being embodied as an example from this godly lady. Boaz said to Ruth, you will, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? 
Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So I want you to see the grace, the grace of Boaz. He was giving to this woman above and beyond what was required by the law. That he saw her, and again, most scholars don't believe this was a, at first, a romantic movement to try to earn her heart. At this point in time, it was just goodwill that he saw someone in need, heard her good reputation, heard about the good work she was doing, and he was moved to compassion to go above and beyond what was required of him as the owner of the land. He wanted to protect her, and he wanted to provide for her. Now don't forget, Boaz pictures Christ. Christ wants to protect us and provide for us. That God wants to extend His grace to us. That God wants to be better to us than we deserve. That God wants to come and love us. God loves us. God cares for us. God is not mad at you. He is mad about you. That God is not trying to get back at you. God is trying to get you back into close relationship with Him. Friends, we praise God for what He has done for us and we worship God for who He is. Amen? That should be the attitude of your life. We certainly do that here on Sunday mornings. We do it through 30 minutes or so of worship. We do it for 45 minutes of, of preaching. But it should be your lifestyle of recognizing that God is protecting you and providing for you. Amen. That He is your kinsman redeemer. That He's just like Boaz. And He's saying that whenever you do get thirsty, whenever you are tired, and whenever you need something, I want to be here to provide it for you. Do not go to the other fields. Don't look to the other places. Don't look to the people who may want to hurt you or harm you. I am the one who wants to take care of you. It teaches us of the singularity of Christ. It's teaching us that there's other things that are vying for our attention. There's other things that are trying to tempt us and sway us and try to draw our attention away. But Christ deserves our singular focus. That He is the one who's been good to us in the past. And since He's been good to us in the past, we can trust He'll be good to us now. And He's true to us now, we know He'll be good to us in the future. Amen? There's no need to look anywhere else. We look to Jesus. We look to our heavenly Boaz. We look to our kinsman, the one who saves us and sustains us, the one who loves us and the one who cares for us. Verse 10, So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? That's a powerful verse. You think about the, the connection with this and the redemption of romance that we're learning. We should always bow down and fall before the Lord in humble gratitude that He's taken notice of us. We said that she happened upon this field. She just happened to come to the right place. We know God was behind that. Let me ask you a question today. When did you just happen upon Christ? When, when did you realize that He took notice of you? When did you realize that Jesus was loving you unconditionally and it drove you to a place of falling before Him and, and it pleading out, God, why have you taken notice of me? The psalmist tells us the question of, God, why have you noticed a little speck like me? God, why have you looked upon me with favor? Just as she was from Moab, a far country, an enemy to Israel, should have been an enemy to Boaz, but Boaz loved her. We, the Bible says, were enemies of God. 
that we were born in a far country in a sinful condition. We were born separated from God. We were in a desperate condition. We could not sustain ourselves. We needed God. We needed Him to show up. Without Him, we would have died physically and spiritually. But thank God, our Boaz showed up. We should be saying every day, God, why have you taken notice of me? Why was Jesus willing to die for a sinner like me? Why would Christ hang on the cross, suspended between heaven and earth, as if being said, I'm rejected by both God and by man, but He did it willingly. The Bible says the joy of the cross was before Him because He loved us. And then each and every day of our lives, we should be reminded of the love of God that He take notice of you, that His eye is upon you. That nothing that you experience in life is apart from God's purview. That He cares about your life. Not just all the big things, but the everyday things. God's eye is upon you. That chronic pain that you are feeling, God's aware of that. That infertility that you're experiencing, God is aware of that. That depression that is plaguing you like the old black dog, God is aware of that. Your finance, you're not sure how you're going to pay the bills next month. I can guarantee you based on authority of God's Word, God is aware of that. You think you're going to be evicted, you're going to lose your home. God knows that. It's not a surprise to God. God is up to something. God is working behind the scenes. The invisible hand of God is moving in the glove of your life. And it should move us to worship. It should move us to praise. It should move us to a heart of commitment to God knowing that He sees us. And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law. This is the death of your husband. And how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and have come to be a people whom you have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. So it's saying here that Boaz recognized that she gave up everything to come to the chosen place of Bethlehem, to come into relationship with her mother-in-law, and eventually to come into contact with Boaz. Friends, for you to be saved, for me to be saved, for us to be right with the Holy God, we've got to leave everything. We have to, to set aside everything else that was so important to us, but compared to Christ, it becomes like nothing. That to follow Christ, you cannot just add Jesus to your life. You cannot just plug Jesus as an appendix or an amendum to what you're already doing. Jesus has to become the center and the circumference of everything for you. That's right. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Salvation in the Christian life has to be Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing. Your Christian life, your spiritual health, your life in the Lord is only through Jesus. He plays. He will not play second fiddle to anything. That He does not want to share uh, our love with anyone else. He wants our full devotion, our full attention, our full commitment. It says here that she came and that she was able to uh, uh, hide under the safety of the wings of the Lord. Now this is a picture given throughout the Bible. Psalms has this picture about God being like a, a large bird that wraps the wings around His children. If you remember Jesus... Right before he came in the Passion Week, looked down on Jerusalem and said, with tears in his eyes, how long I have desired to wrap my arms and wings around you, but you have refused. Here's the thing about the Lord's protection. 
We can refuse it. Here's the thing about God's provision. We can refuse it. Here's the thing about God's salvation is we can refuse it. We can miss out on God's best if we choose to go our own way. But if we choose the way of the Lord, we get to be under His wings. And here's a picture that kept coming to my mind thinking about this verse. Under His wings. Guess when you're under His wings, guess what you're close to? His heart. And you can hear the heart of the Lord. That should be the, the cadence of our life. That should be the rhythm of our desire. We want to get our heartbeat in sync with the Lord's heartbeat. We want to be so close to Him and His arms are safely wrapped around us that whatever life throws our way, we've got the protection and the provision of the Lord upon us. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your other maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat behind the reapers and he passed parched grain to her. And she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Also, let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. Again, this is not just grace. This is grace abounding. This was not just Boaz giving her what she needed. Not just a little bit more than she needed, but a lot more than she needed. Friends, that's the way God wants to lavish His love, His protection, and His provision upon us. We don't have a God of just enough. We got the God of more than enough. Amen. We got a God who can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. Not because of what we have done, but because of who He is. I want you to see Christ in Boaz. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah, ephah of barley. But I don't want you to miss this. Though it was given by Boaz, undeserved by Ruth, she was then faithful with what God gave to her. The Bible says that we are joint partners with God. That we are stewards. That we are managers of all that God has given us. Our very life is a gift from God. And what we do with our life is our gift back to God. You can make a choice. The choice is yours. You can either spend your life, you can waste your life, or you can invest your life. You can live a life for the here and now, for the joys of the moment, or you can live your life on purpose, on meaning, for the glory of God. Amen. We learn at the Mission Church to find our why. What's our purpose? Our purpose is to know God and to make Him known through worship, through discipleship, through fellowship, through ministry, and through evangelism. That is our heart's desire. That is our purpose for existing. To help you to know God through salvation and then to make Him known to a watching world through those five purposes for your life. That's why everything that we program, every ministry we have, it's our prayer for every Sunday for you to develop to be a worshiper of God to disciple, take your next spiritual steps of obedience, to be in fellowship with other believers in Christ, to be involved in ministry, serving the body of Christ, and to evangelize. Taking the gospel, the least, the last, the left out. If you live out those five purposes, you have found your why, you have invested your life, not just spent it. So that was number two. Meeting with Boaz. Quickly, number three, the marveling of Naomi. She marvels. Says this. Then she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? 
Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Boaz said to her daughter-in-law, no, then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Ruth the Moabite said, He also said to me, You shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, and the people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean into the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Don't you see something? That the mother-in-law missed out. She could only hear about this experience secondhand. Ruth was able to experience firsthand because she was willing to go. She was willing to make herself vulnerable. She was willing to go into the field of Boaz. Friends, this is the charge to us today. Let's not miss out on what God has for us. Let's be willing to receive God's best in our life. Let's allow the love of the Lord to captivate our lives and bring us closer to Him. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, And at this time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Have you been brought near by the blood of Christ? Has there been a time where you were in the field in desperate conditions and Christ came to you in your most greatest time of need and has been better to you than you deserve? That begins with salvation. If you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, today is that day for you. Today is a day that you can come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us the story of the Gospel, which is the good news. The bad news was necessary for there to be good news. What's the bad news? That we are spiritually lost and depraved, separated from a holy God. That we are stuck in our brokenness and that we can do nothing to fix it. Sin has brought wreckage in our life. It has devastated us spiritually and it has impacted the world around us. The good news is though, that Jesus came as our spiritual Boaz and made salvation possible through the work that He did on the old rugged cross 2,000 years ago. But you must receive that gift of salvation by faith. And we do that with a simple word of prayer. A prayer where we ask Christ into our lives. Not just into our hearts, but into our entire lives. If that's your need today, with everybody's head up and eyes wide open, if that's your need today to trust in Jesus, I'm talking to you right now. Right now, the Holy Spirit is talking to you right now. If you need to trust in Jesus, right now is your opportunity. You don't have to say this with your mouth, but you need to mean it from your heart. You pray this prayer, your head up and eyes open, knowing full well what you are doing. You pray this prayer, I need Christ. I cannot do it on my own. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe what the Bible says about Jesus, that He lived, died, was buried, He rose again. I believe that with every ounce of my heart. And I believe that if I trust in that, I can be saved. I do that today. Maybe you said that prayer in your heart just now. If you did, as soon as we begin to sing, I'll be in the front ready to receive you. You come up and let me know and I'd love to pray over you. I know Miss Becky would be happy to come and pray with you if you would like to, a female to pray over you. Maybe you just want to let us know through your connection card. You can do that as well. You'll receive a contact this week. 
Maybe there's something else that God's spoken to you about today. Maybe God has been prompting you to have a conversation about believers' baptism. We know that baptism doesn't make salvation so, but it shows it so. That baptism is your first major sign of obedience after you trust in Jesus Christ. It does not guarantee you heaven or does not keep you from heaven. That's dependent upon what you've done with Jesus. But it shows the world that you're not ashamed of being a Christ follower. If that's your need, come let us know. Maybe God's been prompting you to become a covenant member of this church. To move from dating to marriage in the Mission Church of Lexington. Going from courting to committing to the Mission Church. You want to say, this is my church home and I am all in and I want to be committed as a covenant member. If that's you, let us know. Maybe you need to recommit your life. Maybe in the last weeks, months, years, you know you've been in a backslidden condition. You know you've let unbelief, you know you've let rebellion, you know you've let distractions come into your life. You know that you're not walking as closely to Jesus as you once did, and you're tired of that. You're ready today to start afresh with the Lord. You don't need to be saved again. You just need to be recommitted. You need to get refocused upon the Lord. Know that God has never moved. He's the same place He's always been. You've moved. I've moved. Today's the time to move back. Maybe you simply need prayer. Maybe your marriage is broken. Maybe your health is broken. Maybe your mental health is being challenged. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction. Maybe you're struggling with just the pain and the confusion of life and you need prayer. Don't leave this place today without being prayed for. Don't leave this place in that same bondage that you came in. You can live in the freedom that Christ offers for us. The Bible says, the truth shall set you free. The Bible says, when Christ makes you free, you shall be free indeed. We'll get your freedom today.